It's a wonderful honor to be here among so many friends. Uh, standing, because it's 20 minutes, I rarely read my text, but I'm obliged because uh, I sidetrack otherwise. Uh, <clears throat> standing in front of you all today, I have to say, it brings me such great pleasure to see how different the culture is seen in the Arab world is now from where we were when I first started my career in the arts over 30 years ago. In fact, back then, I could not have dreamed that we'd be all sitting here together and there are promising museums, inspiring galleries, big name auction houses flourishing in the region. And more importantly, that becoming an artist, an architect, photographer, filmmaker or designer is now a valid career choice that need not worry parents. Uh, sorry, I can't see the images. It's on a loophole. Uh, do I have to press? The images are not reflected here. Can somebody help me here? I have it on the computer, but not on the screen. Uh, can you go from the beginning, please? Anyhow. Sorry, it, it's on loophole, so it will come. I should have checked. In fact, one of the main reasons I began promoting and representing artists and filmmakers from the region was because I was upset that nobody in the West knew about the great pool of talents that we had. That frustration led me to organize the first ever Arab Film Festival in Paris in 1982, right after the invasion of Lebanon by Israel. It was a cultural answer to a destructive occupation. Sadly, our region has suffered many such dramatic political upheavals in the 20th and 21st century, with the result that until relatively recently, the arts infrastructure either didn't exist or was severely interrupted or destroyed. By arts infrastructure, I mean a system of promotion, archiving, recording, and support. The art, the art schools, galleries, museums, foundation, grants, sponsorship, media coverage, publishing, and libraries that the West takes for granted today. While some countries are beginning to honor their modern cultural heritage, my fellow panelist, George Albit here, is archiving Lebanon's architecture, for example, like our Arab Foundation for Image. Destruction is still taking place in Egypt, Syria, Libya, Iran, Tunisia, and elsewhere. Uh, many artists whose careers were about to take flight on the international seal in the 1970s found their dreams cut short because of the turmoil around them. Uh, apart from the Palestinian occupation, we had Lebanese civil war, which started in 75, the Iranian revolution in 79, the Iran-Iraq war of 8088, the first Gulf and the second Gulf war, and I don't want even to get into the recent uprisings and chaos. As a result, many emerging museums and galleries closed and priorities changed. Uh, I'm showing you here a, a, a loophole of images, because otherwise it would have taken, which are some key moments in Europe, at least, uh, uh, of the presence of the Arab or Iranian cultural uh, uh, events in, in Europe. Those who could emigrate and study abroad in the late 70s and early 80s left, such as Mona Hatoum and Shiraz Hushari, who came to the UK, Shirin Nishat and Rada Amer, who went to the US, or Rashid Qureshi and Adam Hnein, who went to France. Of course, there are many more. Their career slowly flourished in the 90s in the West. Then in Paris in 1987, more than 25 years ago, the Institut du Monde Arabe opened and started showcasing Arab artists. The same year that Dara Tel Hunun opened in Jordan. And I must say, I prefer Dara Tel Hunun. Uh, because of their archiving and the access to the culture, unfortunately, geographically, it's so isolated that um, it's difficult sometimes to get access to those documents. However, when I started out in London, it was a very different scene, story. Also, some wonderful galleries like Sultan Gallery here in Kuwait, L'Atelier in Rabat started in the 70s, or others in Beirut were already showcasing Middle Eastern artists. In the 70s, I did. This was not the case in Europe. In 1986, I moved to London, invited by the Iraqi architect Dr. Mohamed Makia to launch the Kufa Gallery to, and to address the imbalance in the representation of Arab artists. Perhaps this is also a great difference between now and then. Previously, we had few private patronage. Now we have public and institutionalized patronage 
and many private collectors are creating their own foundations and museum. Uh, I don't want only to speak about Arab Image Foundation and others, but only in London alone, INIVA was created in 94, uh, I mentioned Arab Image Foundation in 97, Abraj Price in Dubai, Edgeworth Road Project in Serpentine, Jamil Price at the VNA, Borossian Price in Brussels, Farjam Collection and Salsali two, two foundation in Dubai only. Of course, there are many more now museums opening in Beirut and elsewhere. In 1987, at the Kufa Gallery, <coughs> we showed Mona Hatoum, whose video was acquired 20 years later by Tate Modern, Dia Azawi, the late Ismail Fattah, Etel Adnan, and many others. And Etel Adnan had a solo show at Documenta, some of the images will, you will see. It was a very successful venture, which despite its success, could not really cover its expenses because the prices of the artworks were so low. I decided that after two years, the gallery could run by itself. <clears throat> Meanwhile, uh, by the late 1980s, Iranian cinema started attracting Western attention with its new uh, docu-feature style and unique approach. Kiarostami, Mahbalbaf, Bani Etemad, Robodi, and Panahi were just some of the names. And then many institutions finally became curious about global aesthetics rather than exclusively Western concerns. For example, in Paris in 1989, Les Magiciens de la Terre at Pompidou Center gave platform to non-Western art. Later, this global interest will be linked, of course, with the emergence of new economies uh, an economic interest, whether in Dubai, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Doha, or Nigeria today. Plus the world of internet and the facility it offered to communicate, educate, and update oneself. Change was in the air. Uh, from 1988 to 2008, I became an independent curator trying to promote visual arts and film from the Arab world and Iran in several public institutions in the West, whether what with BFI in London, Rotterdam, or Berlin Film Festival. And the first institution to show an interest in artists living in the country of origin were ethnographic museum. People are a bit snobbish about the ethnographic museum, but they were the first supporters. Such as the British Museum, the Museum of Mankind, the Tropen Museum in Amsterdam, the Smithsonian Institution, the Sackler Gallery, the National Museum of African Art in Washington, D.C., and LACMA, uh, Los Angeles County Museum in uh, Los Angeles. Curators from this institution took an interest in Middle Eastern and North African culture because of their specialist knowledge of the region, their awareness of the gaps in their collection, and above all, because they had courage also. In 2000, several public institutions started racing to be the first to discover art from the region in order to showcase new talents. After the British Museum's word into art, Saatchi started showcasing Middle Eastern, Indian, Chinese, and African art. Uh, they are selling it, by the way. Uh, five days later, he's selling all. At the same time, in the mid to the late 20, uh, 2000, auction houses began to spring up in the region. Christie's and Bonham's in Dubai, Sotheby's in London and Doha, Arcurial in Paris. In fact, because the artists in their auctions were little known outside the region, Sotheby's and Christie's began to produce auction catalogs that were more like exhibition catalogs with details of the artist's CV and specialist essays talking about the work. Meanwhile, many magazines have sprung up, such as Canvas, Bidoon, Brown Book, Contemporary Practices, and Harper's Bazaar. And I'm only mentioning the ones in Dubai. I discovered some new ones in Kuwait. Uh, uh, my colleague earlier on mentioned those. I'm, I'm really very impressed. All these magazines talking art, taking art and culture from the region outside the world of academia and the art industry to art to the general reader. The same goes for art fairs, whether in Dubai, Beirut, Marrakesh, Abu Dhabi, or even Istanbul, who is catering for the first time for Middle Eastern art. Participation in biennales, such as Venice, and we have here some people who initiated those, the first Palestinian pavilion, Kuwaiti pavilion, Iraqi, Iranian, Lebanese pavilions, we never had it before. The Future of Promise exhibition at Venice, which was sponsored by Age of Arabia, uh, which already had started Age of Arabia to promote Saudi artists worldwide. I first discovered Abdel Nasser Ghare, Mohamed Matar, and many, many of the artists, Manal Doyana, I didn't see her in London in their first exhibition there. These were meeting points for people with interest in our region. 
When I look back at my experience in the art world, for me the key moments for person were 1995, because we had published catalogs, uh, when there were several exhibition and film seasons during the Africa 95 festivals in the UK, covering North Africa and several, uh, in several venues. This came along with publication, as I mentioned. And then in 2001, at the, Bar the Barbican exhibition, Iranian Contemporary Art, which was followed two years later by Far Near Distance in House of World Culture in Berlin in 2003. That too brought a fantastic catalog, which remains till today a reference. They received huge numbers of audiences and became reference material because of the catalogs, as I said. Then the British Museum's word into art traveled, uh, like now the Hajj exhibition. Uh, both were curated by uh, Venetia Porter, uh, <clears throat> and we notice today that Asia Society in, in, uh, in New York and in, even in London are getting more and more adventurous and presenting art from the Middle East. However, it would take a while before modern and contemporary institutions like Tate Modern to hold major exhibition of art from the region. Although a few years ago, several institutions started going to Beirut, to Ashgal Alwan, and uh, focused on Lebanon and acquired several artists. And Tate just finished a solo show of Salwa Raudash Air's work. This year, Iran, in Brussels, uh, public institutions were giving shows to Middle Eastern artists. At Vils, a solo show with Monir, at CAP with Iranian artists, and Villa Empire with Lebanese and Arab and mixed uh, Arab and uh, European artists. In Brussels alone. With all the cultural activity in the region in the last five, ten years, some artists from past generation have resumed working and gone to become international stars such as Munir Farman Farmoyan, who only reignited her career in, in, when she was in her 80s. She was in New York from 79 till uh, 2000. Uh, Munir is now in her 90s and still in her studio every day in Tehran with commissions right and left. Japanese, Museum, America, Guggenheim, Metropolitan have acquired her works. As for me in 2008, after two years working on curating an exhibition for Tate Britain, it was called This Is That Place, they invited me to do an answer to the British Orientalist show. The, the, this uh, uh, think tank resulted only in a solo show of Mitra Tabrizian's work, because she was British, that was Tate Britain. But I felt very frustrated, so I realized that I needed to have my own project space to complement what I could not, without wasting much time and energy. Uh, this is why I opened my own project space to, in order to give access to other institutions to artists. However, I've, I, however, I still continue to collaborate with other public institutions, with Beirut Exhibition Center, Leighton House Museum, Villa Stuck in Munich, Cork Museum in Ireland, and many others, because every collaboration opens up new doors to our understanding. Uh, while in 2008, I was the only one in London promoting art from the Middle East and Iran, but in the last two years, several other galleries have opened in London alone, just to cater for the art market. The Ayam Gallery, Salma Feriani, Kashia Hillebrand, PI Gallery from Istanbul, Art Space from Dubai, and it seems more, uh, more and more to come from Dubai. Lori Shabibi, I heard uh, uh, from, uh, from them that they might open also a gallery in London. And Dubai alone has more than 30, 40 galleries now. Uh, in New York alone also, this year, uh, there is an exhibition called Modern Iran at Asia Society, but several galleries, uh, Taimur Grahme opened, uh, Shirin Gallery, uh, and Leila Heller uh, since five years. But so it means that even New York now is opening up their doors to, to the Middle Eastern art. Some may be jumping on the bandwagon, but it is, is that such a bad thing? The bandwagon rolls on, and means the culture stays alive. I think we should all be delighted to discover more talents, more publications, more foundation, and more seminars, and meeting points such as this. I wanted to thank you all for inviting me to this wonderful gathering. I'm very honored. Thank you.
Of course you can ask. Uh, uh, I didn't know there was a I was given 20 minutes to give a talk, but of course I'm here for four or five days. Any of uh, young students, anyone here, young or not young, is more than welcome to come and meet me. I will be here all these four days. Oh, and Yes, everybody is young, <laughs> for younger part, certainly. I'm the oldest, I can notice that. <laughs> if there is any question, if not, uh, really, you can, of course, uh, uh, ask uh, whatever you want uh, by email or uh, personally here. As I said, I'm here for quite a few years. Yes, Hale. Wide and general question, Hale. I, I, I would say uh, very often people ask me about market. I'm not interested. I mean, of course, I'm interested in the market because I want artists to survive and galleries to survive. However, the value of a work has nothing to do with the market. The value of the work is intrinsic, even if an artist never sells a work. Uh, uh, if the market influences an artist, then an artist is not a good artist. Uh, uh, if there is uh, some, uh, there, there, there could be, the, the, the way it can influence an artist is that by encouraging them, by giving them the financial support that they need, then they can have bigger studios, bigger work, this I'm all for it. But I think uh, an artist has always, they say what they have to say. I think my, my talk started, unfortunately we missed the beginning, I should have checked, with the quotation of Rumi says, whatever comes, comes from a need a sore distress, a hurting want. I don't think you can force an artist to just do something without them wanting to do it. They, have, they, they, have, they must have something to say. And this is what comes uh, through in a good artwork. Uh, whether uh, the, the, the styles have changed and some people cater with veils or calligraphy, and th it comes and goes. I'm not, I cannot say I'm interested in that. I'm not interested in the, of course, but this is a book to be made on its own. It will be very difficult for me to give you samples in this milieu. But I think good artists don't cater for anyone. They, they want a communication and they have something to say and they do it. Thank you. Any other questions? I, I think it's the beginning. It will be very difficult to warm up people to questions. <laughs> but uh, please uh, do, 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 do interrupt me when we are outside for coffee breaks or anything. I'm more than happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you for, for your patience. <laughs>